got a recording started. Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to PC 310. Thanks for connecting to the class today. Let's um, <clears throat> take a moment and pray together, and then we'll get started. Um, all right. May I request somebody to pray, please, and we'll get started. So don't you want to pray if it's okay? It's, uh... Charles, you want to pray? Go ahead. Okay. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. Mm. King of glory, we pray that you will teach us through Pastor Ashish that we'll be able to learn exactly what you have asked us to learn. Thank you that you are also giving us the energy to concentrate and be able to pay attention so that we can learn very well. We thank you for those that are yet to come, but you are bringing them. Mm -hmm. And even us who are here that we are going to listen in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So in this course on church and ministry administration, we uh, last week, uh, not last week, we didn't have classes last week, but before that, we had covered up till uh, uh, chapter five and chapter six, lesson five and lesson six. Let me just quickly share that so just, just to refresh our memory and then we will move forward. <clears throat> so in lesson five, we talked about the importance of having administrative policies and guidelines. So we went through that. And then lesson six, which was the last lesson we were covering, we were talking about operations, you know, having proper systems and processes in place for various areas of our ministry, uh, make sure that everything is functioning well. And, uh, you know, the fact is, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we will never reach a place of perfection in the sense that there will always be things we can keep improving, you know, every area of ministry. So uh, our goal is to try to, you know, be as excellent as possible. But the fact is, there's always room for improvement. So in every area of ministry, uh, you keep on, you know, uh, addressing things, watching how things are going and encouraging people to keep improving so that, you know, uh, uh, we can over time become better and better in what, what's happening in the ministry. So just give some examples. And it kind of left you with a little exercise to think about. Uh, there were two exercises uh, you know, just for you to think about. Uh, apply this matter of this content. So let's quickly talk about it. We'll spend a few minutes on this and then move on to our next uh, lesson. So if you were setting up a traveling ministry, right? So that means you're a itinerant speaker, preacher, you know, whether an evangelist or a Bible teacher or some kind of a traveling ministry, which means you, you'll be traveling all over the world. Uh, and it may be you, you may have, you know, a few associates, so you, there may be a team of people traveling. So uh, it'll be more than one person. And of course, you know, your teaching and preaching is one of the aspects. You may have other things going on. You know, you may be releasing content online. You may be writing books. You may be, you know, so the ministry is more than just the speaking engagement. There's a lot of other things also happening. So. If that was your kind of ministry, how what would what are some of the things, systems, and process you will put in place so that this ministry does well? It serves the people well. So let's just kind of talk about it. Uh, I'm, I'm not giving it as a written assignment or anything, but just for our discussions, 
if people want to share your, if you want to share your thoughts, you know, imagine you are the head of this ministry. You're one of the main speakers. You have to travel different places, speaking, ministering to different audiences. Plus, let's say, you know, you have three or four people who are part of your team. They're also doing this. And then you may have other aspects of ministry involved. Uh, so just imagine. And, and let's just share some thoughts. Anybody wants to describe uh, what would be your uh, organization structure and the systems and process you will put in place to make sure your ministry is serving the people well? Anyone? He wants to go. All right, I'm going to call out some names here. <laughs> All right. I'm going to attempt. Yes, Kennedy, go ahead. Is it good to have an advanced team before you start your ministry? Uh, sorry, well, what was that team again? Advance. Yeah. Uh, what, Can you have what, an advanced team? Okay, what would this team do? Uh, advanced team, meaning? This team will do the set work for you, what okay. you need to do, where, mm. you go, where you have to spend, mm. because you're traveling with people. You can mm. go on your own. Mm. Yeah. Okay, good. So you're going to have a team who will take care of all the logistics. If I understood correctly, they will go ahead plan out everything. So that's really important, right? Suppose you're having a conference in a city. Uh, usually, the planning starts, say, 12 months ahead. Uh, yes, if it's a smaller conference, of course, you can do it within three, four months. But uh, depending on how big it is, you know, people start planning sometimes two years in advance, sometimes 12 months in advance, sometimes three, four months in advance. So that's your team. You need a, you need a team. You know, you, you can call it logistics, uh, but Kennedy used the word advance. So I was trying to understand that. Um, you know, basically, they take care of all the logistics, the planning, the, so many things that need to be done ahead of time. So definitely, that's one team you know, that you will have to have in place. Very good. What else? So you're you're a traveling minister. What what kind of things do you need to back you up? Okay, let me see the chat here. Tarun has shared. Be sensitive to cultural differences. Get the team trained on cultures. Have a user friendly expense tracking system. Okay. So Tarun has highlighted two important things. One is being culturally sensitive. I think that's very important because, you know, if you're traveling in different places, it's not the same everywhere, uh, especially if you're going to different countries. Uh, you know, you have to be sensitive that when you come there, I mean, how you go about doing things. Uh, you know, you have to be respectful, sensitive to the culture. Uh, so that the people you're sending out, of course, they should be, you know, since you don't want to do anything to offend people, even if it's just, you know, it's a cultural thing, but, you know, you need to be respectful. And another thing that I pointed out is um, an easy to use expense tracking system. So that's, again, another important thing, because people are going to go ahead, they're going to have the personal expenses, they would need to be, you know, you need to monitor, I mean, they would have all these expenses, you need to track these things, whatever needs to be reimbursed, vendors need to be paid, all kinds of things. And so if you have a very simplified process, that will help. So that's, that's kind of having to do with the financial side of things, which is also very important. So you need to have financial side. So we, we, we said we need to have a logistics team, we need to have people who are culturally sensitized, we need to have a good financial system there to take care of all the expenses, team expenses, other expenses as well. Sri Kumar has shared um, preparation and prayer. That's important. 
proper communication. Um, uh, I'm assuming that's within the team. Yeah, you need to have that. You know, uh, so these are some of the things to think about. And and in a few, there are many other other things. For example, if you're having a if you're having a conference, you may need people to register for those things. So again, it should be the public. Uh, you need a, a team that will do the publicity for you, the promotions for you. Uh, and these promotions have to be targeted. So that means uh, if you're doing a conference in a city or you're going to be speaking in a particular city, you want to, of course, let the people in that area know. You don't want to let you know, random people in parts of the world that they're not going to be there. So you don't want that information to go there. But you want to target your promotions, your thing, your uh, announcements. So you need to have a good IT system that records your database as people are re registering. You could, you know, keep uh, uh, informing them about upcoming events and so on. Yeah. And uh, a good admin. Yeah, I see Roshan's uh, comments, the website, admin, staff, resources, prayer, counseling. Yeah. So you need a good backup of admin when people call uh, they will, you know, uh, want to know information about the event. Should have people responding. Also, as an itinerant minister, you know, part of your your finances, uh, of course, uh, if you're going, if you if you've been invited by a church or organization, they will probably give you an honorarium. But otherwise, your funding, your finances, is coming through the support of people you know the, the those who want to support your ministry so you need to think about that you need to have a a way by which um you would be able to receive fine financial contributions and then you need you need to have a good way of acknowledging you know somebody sends some money there's got to be they got to get a reply saying thank you kind of thing uh, whenever that's possible now um uh, what I wanted to say was, so as a traveling minister, the principle that you apply is, if you sow into people's lives spiritually, then you can receive from them fin financial, materially. So this is biblical, right? We read about this in First Corinthians 9, also in Galatians chapter 6. So uh, you don't have a local church congregation supporting your ministry. The ministry is being supported by people wherever they are who are being served spiritually through your traveling ministry so you need to have a good system it should be robust so that anybody who wants to give will be able to give to support your work now as a traveling minister you may have multiple people on your team uh, you know so then the scheduling and the planning multiplies. That means it will be not just you. You may be going to one city, but another team member will be going to another city. Another team member will be going to a third city. So this whole planning and all of logistics, all that has to be replicated for every team member so that everywhere these conferences, meetings can happen very well. And then if your, your team is producing additional resources, like maybe you are producing books, uh, you're releasing content online. Uh, so even there, that has to be, you know, you have to think about whether you want to give it for free, whether you want to charge for it. If you're going to charge for it, you know, again, that's another source of income to support the ministry, but you need to have a good system in place for those kinds of things as well, right? So, uh, so you have to think about, you know, this traveling ministry, it's a very valid ministry. God calls people to be uh, traveling ministers. They go around. And then depending on the kind of ministry you're doing, you need to have a good organization backup uh, supporting that. Very quickly, if we talk, um, Christopher, go ahead, please. You have a comment or a question. Uh, yes, but I was just also thinking that um... Uh, you know, if we, if we back up a little bit, um, you know, uh, at the start of this of this ministry, uh, there is a need to uh, decide whether you know there is a certain focus um, target audience mm. and also a focus uh, geography that we want to you know uh, uh, target, um, and uh, this also establishes a brand, uh, you know, uh, in a in a sense for for that ministry. It could mm. be one person, it could be multiple people. So uh, mm. uh, I think uh, that would be important. And um, 
particularly when it comes to you know getting invited by uh, you know um, by churches or mm. by um, you know certain uh, certain cities or whatever you know the geographies that uh, where we want to where the where the uh, this ministry wants to uh, uh, you know operate in mm -hmm. so yeah story like that that's good it's very good actually that's very important you know uh, what kind of ministry would it be are you targeting the youth are you targeting you know that you, you you hear about different specialized ministries you know some people will specialize on uh, okay we want to do things for marriage married couples or you know we want to do things for the youth or we want to do things for professionals whatever that's a good point so then you begin to target so based on uh, what you've been called to do you will decide on the areas where you, which cities or where which parts of the world you're going and so on that's very important so very quickly uh so the other exercise was you know just like that you can think about well if you're running if you're having a bible college if you want to run a bible college you got to think through the whole process again right so it's nice to say i want to have a bible college but it's not a simple thing to do right because there are so many parts of this whole thing uh, this whole organization or ministry that has to run well right so right from you know, you think about promotions. How do you create awareness that there is a Bible college? And how, why should people come to this particular Bible college when you have, uh, when people have so many options today, right? So how would you promote? How would you present yourself? What are the differentiators? Then you need to think about where are your students going to come from? You know, uh, how are you going to get the students to come? And then, what are the modes of your teaching? Is it going to be all in person nowadays? You know, you have to think about that. Is all going to be in person? Is it going to be online? What? How are we going to teach them? And then you got to think about the whole facilities. If you're going to have on campus, you know, the, just keep maintaining the facilities, running the facilities. If you're going to have residential students, then you have to think about all the other things that happen with it: their their accommodation, their food, uh, their daily schedule. You know, the things that they need, uh, so on. So all of these things you have to think about if you want to, run. even if you're running a simple Bible college, you have to think about all of these things. And um, we need to put people in place to uh, make sure all these things function well. All right, let's move forward. Um, we'll move to the next lesson today, which is, again, a very, uh, you know, I feel that all of these <laughs> All of these things are important, uh, and I keep saying some, sometimes I say something is important, but actually uh, every piece to this whole thing, our ministry is uh, is important. So today we're going to talk about um, church staff management. Mm -hmm. So what we are really talking about is how do you you know how do you manage the people who are employed by the organization. So we just call them church staff. You can call them employees. You can whatever whatever language you want. I, I I'm just calling them church staff because that's kind of what we the language we use here. Um, but these are people who are working for the organization. They are paid by the organization. They are working for the organization. Uh, the Christian talking about the Christian ministry, right? So that's what we mean by church staff. Now, at a high level, when you look at it. For most Christian organizations, uh, you would have at least three categories. Sorry, you'll have at least three categories of people. You'd have staff. When we use the word staff, we're talking about full time people. So they are working full time for the organization. Then we use the word consultants. These co consultants are like part time, that means they will work uh, any number of hours that they have available. Uh, you know, and 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 so they're paid uh, hourly. So we refer to them as consultants. They're paid according to the work they do. And then we have a big set, which are volunteers. Hmm? So volunteer management. We will talk about that in a separate lesson. I think it's the next lesson. So we'll talk about that separately, uh, because that is a, a very important part of 
the Christian ministry. A, a lot of Christian ministries uh, are volunteer driven, or maybe they, or they have a very big part or place for volunteers to serve. You know, and 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 that is important, especially if you're talking about a church organization, a church-based organization. A lot of volunteers will be there. Uh, it is also true of general other kind of Christian ministries. People will come and they say, "I like to volunteer. I like to just, you know, give my time and effort uh, at no charge." And so, uh, this is an important area. We'll talk about it. But when we talk about church uh, staff here, uh, I, I'm mainly referring to those who are full time, plus those who may be paid hourly you know, or part time. Okay, so we're talking about paid people. Who are part of the organization? So uh, you may, you, in, in your part of the world, you may be using a different word than consultants and staff. But th these are just terms that we use. Uh, you, know, you may be using different, different. You may call them differently, and that's okay. Right? Just the only difference is uh, when we say consultants, we're talking about people who are paid hourly or on work. So, for example, our translators, people who translate our books into different languages. They are paid, you know, by the work they do. You know, for each book, they'll have a certain cost based on the number of pages they translate, and they're paid for that. So, like that, you know, or those who do video, video dubbing, you know, so they, they, they uh, dub the English sermon into the local language, Hindi. So then they get paid per forty-five minutes of dubbing video. So like that, there are different people who get paid on a work basis. Then the others are paid on an hourly basis. So, uh, you know, what must we keep in mind when you're thinking about staff? I want to start at the very beginning. The very beginning is your hiring process. You see, uh, we need to have a very good hiring process. Um, because, uh, especially when you're, you know, just depending on the, on the role that they're having, you know. It, our, our goal, of course, is to bring the right people in to the right roles that you have in your organization. And for that, it begins here at the hiring process. So first, uh, you need to clearly define what is the role that you're trying to fill. So maybe it's a pastoral role, maybe it's a administrative type role, maybe it's a technical role, like a you know part of your IT team or your graphics team or your video editing, whatever you, you have. Uh, so the skills, uh, the required skills, the required background, um, the the kind of person you're looking for, and the, you know what what are they going to do, what are the responsibility? You need to write it down. So we have intentionally. Before we start our hiring process, first thing we do is we write down the role description. You know, uh, so uh, and, and you can find examples of that in our website apcworg slash guidelines So write it down. So this way, everybody is very clear what kind of person you should be looking for, and the person who's applying also is very clear what is expected from them. There is no ambiguity that. They can't say, "Well, I didn't know I'm supposed to be doing this. Uh, I didn't. Did, I didn't know this was what was expected of me." No, it's all very clear. It's written down, so there can be no. Uh, we try to avoid as many mistakes. The next thing is to have a proper interview process. <clears throat> you know what I, I, I observed, and I'm not saying this in a demeaning way. I'm just saying from observation, is that generally. You know, uh, in Christian ministry, or the Christian organization especially, we, we, we don't think about having a proper interview process. You know, the pastor will find somebody in church, uh, he likes the person, okay, come and join, start tomorrow, like that. Or he will have his, you know, some relatives, okay, you come and join, you start working. And generally, you know, in Christian ministry, it's it happens like that, and that is actually not good. Because you, uh, you know, because we might end up putting people in places that they don't really have the skills to do what is expected. Then there's problems, and then there is bad feelings, and then you know all kinds of things happen. 
So I feel this interview process, which is a very neutral process, that means it doesn't matter, you know, who you are. Uh, that is, you know, of course, as long as you meet the criteria, you, know, you go through, everybody goes through the same process of interview. And uh, yeah, and then we get them started, right? Now, the depending on the role, uh, you, the process could vary. That means, you know, of, uh, for example, uh, in, in some cases, I don't even get involved. Like when, uh, um, example, translators, uh, I'm not even involved in that. You know, we have a person who's handling publications. That person will, you know, select, you know, who are going to be the translators. They have their own picture. They decide, they hire, they do it. So I don't, I'm not even involved in that. But they they will choose, okay, you know, they will find the translator. They will do have the calls. They will do the discussion. They will select the trans people who are going to do a translator. Similarly, in consultants, in many areas, uh, I don't get involved. I let the person who is... Uh, heading that ministry, decide on whom they want to have on their team. So I'm not, I, I, I may recommend, I say, hey, yeah, why don't you ask these five people, you interview them and you choose whom you want, if I know people in that, who are good in that area. But otherwise, I don't get involved. It's okay, so you find out, you interview, uh, you go, you select, you, you come back and tell me, I may just do the final, you know, meeting or something like that. But generally, this is a neutral process. That means that it's not based on do I like, the, you know, I know this person, so I'll hire. No, it's based on does this person meet the required skills? And so we have a proper interview process. Just like how, you know, in the corporate world, when people apply for jobs, they go through a proper process. Even us, we as Christian organizations should have some sort of a process. So simple things like, okay, people have to submit a resume. And we get lots of emails every day, you know, from people from around the country. Uh, they'll say, oh, I'm looking for a job. I want to work for a Christian organization. Can you consider me? Those kind of emails keep coming almost every day. And, you know, it's like, hey, they're not even sending a resume. We don't even know. How can you even think about hiring somebody, you know? So they have, there has to be okay. You have to send a resume. We need to know your background, whatever you you know, something about what you have done, what is the experience you're bringing, et cetera. Then, of course, you, uh, you from after you look through the resumes, you identify potential candidates. Uh, so this is what our HR person you know, does, of course. And then they do an initial phone screening. So it's a phone interview just to, you know, go through what they've said, see if they really fit. Uh, usually we will also check English, I mean, depending on the role, do they speak good English, can they communicate clearly, uh, do they have the required experience, et cetera, et cetera. Then uh, we may give them a practical test. So the next round, you know, so especially if it's a technical role, like if you're a video editor, a graphic designer, uh, you're a software developer, uh, whatever, you know, this technical role, then we give them a practical assessment. Uh, so, for example, if you're a proofreader, you know, okay, so we will make, we will give you a practical test to, you know, you you read through this doc, you know, two page, three page document, and let do the, you know, do the proofing of it. So we'll see, you can see your skills, right? So that will happen, and sometimes either that or there'll be an in-depth interview. So especially if it's like a pastoral role, of course. Um, we can't give them a practical assessment, so we have to do an in-depth interview. So, or a counselor, you know, things like that. Uh, so we have an in-depth interview where uh, you know it might be a two-hour interview. We ask them a lot of questions uh, about what they've done, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and all of that. So then there's a group interview where you know if they do well in this, let's assume that they've done well here. Then the group interview is okay. Who are they going? The team that they're going to be part of will interview them. So if, if it's a pastoral role, then uh, 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 all the pastors, associate pastors, would interview this person because everybody has to be comfortable with that person. Uh, if it's um, uh, you know, so if it's a just so this group interview, of course, depends on the role. If it's a counselor, then our counselors who are there right now will interview them as a group. 
so there's a group interview. And then there's a final round where they will meet with me in most cases. If it's uh, a role that I'm, you know, they're not going to report to me directly or I'm not, you know, if I, I'm dissatisfied with others, if the others make an assessment, then uh, this, they may skip this. Uh, but if it is something where it's an important role, they will meet with me. Here, I, I, I really check on, you know, will they fit into our culture? Uh, what kind of a personality are they? You know, are, uh, are, you know, this is very important for me because if they don't fit into our culture, if they have attitudes that are that are wrong, uh, if they, you know, they're off, if they go off on a, all these kind of things I try to, filter here at this thing. So they may be technically good, they may be very good in their work and all that, but if they don't fit in to how we want to work, I would filter it out here. So, And then finally, if they go through all of this, then we give them a formal job off. Now, some of you may think, hey, why should a church do this? You know, why should a church, why should a Christian organization do this? I feel it's very important because, you see, if you have somebody in who is not performing or who is not doing their work well or they are they don't fit into the culture it can disrupt a lot of things you know and here you're trying to serve the people well uh, you're trying to give people the best you can and uh, and if you, if you if you bring in wrong people it can really cause problems and uh, the ministry gets affected. So I feel the hiring process is very, very important uh, as you bring people in to uh, the organization. What are some of the things you would check? I'll just finish a little more ground and then we'll take questions. Um, you know, some, some simple things. I check motivation. You know, why are you applying to APC? So uh, we, we also ask people to submit a personal statement. You know, why do you want to work for a Christian organization? Then, of course, we want to check competence, their skills, their calling, their passion. We want to look at their work history. If somebody's been jumping a job every one year, they're changing jobs. For us, you know, that's immediately a red flag. That means they'll stay with us only one year, then they'll go on. And by the time... Uh, you know, they've actually learned how to do things well, they're moving on, so that's not nice. Uh, so we look at their work history. Uh, uh, one of the common questions I ask people is, you know, uh, uh, the blank sheet question. So I just tell them, suppose I give you a blank sheet of paper, and I tell you, you can do whatever you want. There's no constraint of money, there's no constraint of anything. You can do anything you want. What would you do? What were the top three things you would do? Now, the reason I ask that question is then you really get to know what they really want to do, you know, and uh, versus the job they're applying for. So uh, if the job they're applying for matches with what they really want to do, that's a very good sign. You know, that means they're going to really enjoy the work. But if what they really want to do is something else and they're just looking at this as a, job that they work well you know i'm not saying it's wrong i'm just saying that you're aware that it's going to take a little bit more effort for them to be happy in the job because what they really want to do is something else and this is just something they they do for work uh we do practical assessments i mentioned that and also uh i, I would ask questions uh, to explore, you know, are there any harmful, dangerous characteristics, you know. So, for example, I'd say, you know, so, you know, what are the biggest problems you had with your previous boss? You know, example, I just ask a question like that. And then they start telling you how bad their boss was and how terrible person he is. Then you know that's not a good attitude, you know. It's a red flag. It's a dangerous attitude. You know, or you might say, you know, what was the most difficult situation you had uh, working with your team members and then they start telling you how bad their team members were and all of them that's a red flag you know so that means they're not willing to take responsibility for their own actions they're always putting the blame on other people you know and that's a that's a dangerous attitude so like this you know uh, we would look at it 
some other red flags, for example, if they come late for an interview, that's it. Example, two weeks back, there was one person who was supposed to come for an interview at 5 o'clock. At 4.45, he calls and says, uh, I, you know, uh, I'm, I'm late. Uh, I can't come. I told our HR, tell him not to come. We're not going to interview. Right? Because for me, that's a sign of irresponsibility. You know, you've got an interview at 5 o'clock. You have to be in, in this office at 5. If you're late, you have to call us at least two hours before. You know that you're late. Call us two hours earlier and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be late or whatever the reason is. But if you're calling 15 minutes before and saying I'm late, that's not acceptable. You know, so we just didn't even bother into it. He had good skills. Uh, he had already gone through the technical interview. Everything was fine. So he had to come for the last interview with me. But he that's it. Couldn't come on time, cancel. We don't want some we don't want a person like that on our team. There has to be responsibility. You have to take this seriously. Yeah. So we also see how they treat staff. You know, so when they come into the office, we have a front office person, office manager. Do they talk to all these people respectfully? You know, or if they talk to them, you know, disrespectfully, then we don't want them in our team. You know, they, you have to treat everybody with respect. Uh, so I mentioned this, they speak negatively with past employers' experiences. Uh, if they are judgmental, critical about other denominations, churches, you know, of course, there are many uh, different denominations, churches, but we should love people. We shouldn't judge them, criticize them. You know, so when we ask questions, we would see how they work. Um, simple thing, you know, uh, if they come unprepared. So I ask them, so what do you know about APC? And it's so funny, a lot of people who come for interview, they don't know much about the church. That means they haven't prepared, you know, they're just coming for a job. They're not, they haven't looked into the organization that they are looking at, you know. That means they haven't, you know, all our, a lot of information is on our church website. So if, if they just spend, you know, half an hour going to the church website, they'll get to know who we are, but they haven't done that. And so then that means they're not, good people who are taking this seriously. They may have great skills, but they're unprepared. Or sometimes I'll ask them about the role they're applying, you know, so what do you, you know, I want to make sure they've actually gone through the role description because we've made a lot of effort in writing out the role description. And if they don't make the effort to read it, it's a sign that, you know, they don't take these things seriously. So then uh, we just, we don't bother. We just let them go. Um, so another thing is if they, you know, uh, if, if they give vague answers, you know, why, why are you leaving your previous job or your current job? And, uh, you know, they're not being clear and honest. Um, then they're covering things up. So then that's a red flag for us. Right? Um, so all of these things. And then even if family members are applying, they all go to the same process. There is no preferential treatment. And so on. Okay. So let me pause here. I, I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking this, these guys are crazy <laughs> or uh, what? Um, so, all right. Um, everybody's okay so far? You're, you've understood? Uh, uh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, I see your comments there. Um, Good, okay, thank you. All right, yeah, absolutely, no problem. No problems running late, yeah. And um, uh, Elisha, okay. Yeah, so, you know, uh, I know this sounds, uh, uh, this sounds, you know, very, uh, very, uh, <laughs> very, uh, I don't know what, what to say, like very strict, uh, something very strict. Uh, but really, I feel it's very important because if you bring the right people in, everything is going to go well with the ministry, with the organization. But if you bring, you know, somebody in with a bad attitude and so on, it can be very, very difficult, very difficult. You know, so uh, Christopher has a question. Uh, please provide real life examples of dangerous attitudes. You know, um, 
So here's an example. Uh, uh, we had a person. Now, uh, I don't know if I give, I give, if you mention the role, some of you might know who I'm talking about. So I won't mention the role he had with us, but he had a very important role with us. So uh, and this happened just recently, I'm talking about so the last couple of years. Anyway, so he was with us and uh, he, uh, he was you know, decent in his work. And um, and uh, uh, and uh, so this was before the pandemic. So 2020, before 2020, uh, um, uh, he he had already worked with us. I think two years before that, or something like that. He'd been with us for some time. Then the pandemic pandemic happened. So you know a, a lot of things shut down. So what I did was. Um, I told people, so this was 2020. Uh, yeah, this actually this happened in uh, yeah 2022. So 2021, it's the second year. So first year pandemic happened. 2020, a lot of things closed, shut down. A lot of ministries we shut. So everybody was working from home, and you know we told people, okay, yeah, you work from home, and you you know keeping things going and, and so on. Then. In uh, 2021, uh, we reopened, and again, things shut down. See, I'm getting mixed up with this 2020 or 2021. I'm, I'm really sorry. Ah, I forget which year this happened. Just forgive me. I, I might get a little mixed up here. Uh, I, ah, when did this happen? 20. OK, anyway, I, I'm, I'm getting a little mixed up between 2020 and 2021. Anyway. But so, well, okay, here's what happened, right? So everybody had to work from home. So I gave this person, uh, and, I, and um, I, I gave to all our staff, I said, say, okay, everybody's working from home. We can't meet in the office, this, that, it's locked down. So each of you, please work on different things. You know, I gave them all things to work on, and I gave this person. And, and at that time, I told a lot of our people, you know, to do a lot of writing work, documentation work, you know, so okay, you document your part of, what you're doing this is a good chance to catch up on those kinds of things so so i gave that kind of work to almost all our staff uh, and and so to this person also i gave i said see you document your area of work document and i said see uh, we want to build your department so right now your department has only one person you but the next step for us is to hire two or more three people under you so that you can grow your department, and uh, especially we are, you know, very soon we're going to start our building project. We're going to buy land and all of that. So uh, it's going to be a lot of work. So let's start preparing for that now. And therefore, you need to prepare to increase your department. And part of that is you need to document all the process, what's happening. So when new people join, uh, it'll be easy for us to, you know train them and get them ready to be part of it. So that was the motivation. So I told him, please write this. And I gave him time. So I said, you know, after, uh, so, so this was in March, April, May, I think May, I gave two months. Okay, in two months, send the document to me. Now, all the others did their work. They sent it, you know, we were going about it. This person didn't do it. So I said, what happened? You know, because we don't have a lot of other work going on. Uh, this was, it's a simple, you know, maybe five, 10 page document you can write, or maybe even less, maybe five pages, that's all. Two months or whatever the time was, yet not done it. I followed up, I said, what happened? At least you should tell me it's done, it's not done. No, he did. So I said, okay, you know, fine, be kind, give him another month, please finish it. Didn't happen. And so, you can imagine, this is a Christian organization. There's a lot of grace. <laughs> I waited six months for a five-page document. Now, if the same thing happened in the corporate world, I wouldn't wait five months. I wouldn't wait one week. I would have fired immediately if they don't do their work in a corporate setting. Now, because we're a Christian organization, okay, you know, grace, grace, all that. Six months, he did it. So for me... It's not that he didn't 
have the capacity. Here's an example of a bad attitude. Right? Uh, we are being gracious. We are saying, hey, please do this. If everyone else has done their work, you know, and I'm, please be gracious, I'm giving time. I even gave him reference documents. I said, you know, look at these documents. This is how it's going to be, you know, this is what we need for our organization. We need to grow the department. We need to hire more people. Um, you know, once there's a lot of work coming up, you know, once we come out of the pandemic, uh, so let's get ready for it. So I was being so gracious, but his, his attitude was no. And now finally, at the end of six months, I had to deal with it in the sense that called him, called other team members. I said, see, so I, I had to involve other people and because I they wanted them to know that I'm not dismissing him arbitrarily. I explained the whole situation. I said, see, this is how often I was reminding this, how often I was requesting. I even provided reference documents. Um, we did all of that. And yet till now, nothing has been done. And there is no real reason. It's not like he didn't know, he didn't have the skill. It was just, I'm not, I don't care kind of attitude. And so we had to dismiss him. Yeah. So, so this is just one example where this person, not that he didn't have the skill or he didn't know what to, how to do it, just he didn't care. And uh, he was in a place of responsibility. Uh, I don't know what he thought. Maybe he thought that there's no way I could be fired or whatever his reasoning was. I don't know. But we dismissed him. And, um, you know, sad to say, uh, he came back to me about four weeks ago and asked if he could rejoin us. For me, I cannot take him back. Why? Because I didn't see a change in the attitude. Now, there are many people who have left us and we've taken them back, uh, you know, uh, but in this particular case, I said, you know, in my mind, said, there's no way I can take him back uh, because uh, attitude, you know, that is a big issue. All right, so sorry, I didn't mean to bore you all with <laughs> these things, but uh, these are, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, 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 this is um, uh, these are the, re the the real side of you know a Christian running a Christian organization and so on. Uh, uh, you have to deal with these things, and attitude is important. Okay, all right. Uh, let's before we go for break. Okay, I see uh, Christopher. Some of us may want to become a Bible college teacher. I may have missed this, but I don't see a role description for this in the role. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you're right, Christopher. We haven't um, we haven't uh, put that out yet uh, because as of now, I, uh, you know, it's up. Oh, pastors, pastors were doing a lot of the teaching, um, but um, uh, definitely, uh, uh, you know, and and also we just reopened, so uh, students coming on campus is still very small. Like right now, we have only. Uh, 13, 14, 15, something like that, students, you know. So I think once things start picking up and, you know, people feel more comfortable getting back on campus, all those kinds of things, uh, we will, unless we need more staff, we will put that out when the need rises. And yeah, we will do that. And usually we do hire people, and especially for Bible college, we take our own people because then they know those who have studied with us, they know. The curriculum, they know the content, and they know very important is they fit into the culture. So we usually don't take people from just random colleges because, uh, uh, for us, content is very important. You know what we're teaching. Uh, uh, so because that's our differentiator as a college. Yeah. So we we'll let you know. We'll, we'll put that out. Yeah. Any other questions on, on this? Uh, there's a lot more to talk about. I just uh, mentioned the hiding process. Any any other questions? Okay. Okay, Louis, go ahead, please. 
Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if you asked if this is a psychological question, but it's just that sometimes I wonder how we journey as Christians and then Christian staffs, how we journey from a place of commitment. Um, you know, there's that passion at, this, at, this, at the beginning, then after a while, we begin to develop some attitude. The reason I'm saying this is because in the corporate world, you know, it's, it's, they could call it training, but in, in the church settings, you go to church, you hear messages, you hear different things that come from the pulpit. But after a while, you begin to develop some kind of um, attitude. How do we journey? How do we journey from such one end to the other end, you know, in the, in the, even in the spiritual, quote unquote, spiritual atmosphere? Mm-hmm. So you're talking about, your, your, is your question like, why why do like we believers get a bad attitude? Is that your question? Or yeah, th- yeah, just from the example you shared, you know, how mm-hmm. someone that started at first, you know, with that sense of commitment, faithfulness, and then, then after a while he begins to journey into maybe there was an offense or something, but then an attitude comes into the picture, but mm-hmm. yet you cannot still correct it, even though you're sit you're sitting under the word of God, the influence of the spirit, but at that point in time, it's like your heart is, it's, it's kind of severed mm. regarding the work, but not mm. regarding the fellowship of the, with the brethren. But I just feel that if you're having fellowship with the brethren, it should, it should tamper your heart, even though there was an offense, even though there was something that's going wrong, such that it doesn't affect the work that you're doing with the brethren in this context, mm. you know, because we are a spiritual body. You know? But sometimes, if you stay in that in that sphere of, of bad attitude, you know, here we are mm. taken out of the system. But sometimes we are not taken out of the fellowship, but we are just taken out of the administrative system because of your attitude. Mm. But yet we, we remain in the fellowship of the brethren because we don't have to be still part of the body. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, so I think, um, see one, I mean, and there could be many, but one of the um, big negative attitudes that usually develops and in you know we all like you said we all start out well uh we're serving god etc etc we're part of the fellowship and we're serving but one of the common negative attitudes i see is a sense of entitlement that means you feel like hey i deserve to be in this place and uh, I, know I deserve this place. Nobody can take it from me. It's a feeling of entitlement. And uh, that is a dangerous attitude because then you feel that you deserve this. You deserve this position. You deserve this place. You deserve, uh, you know, whatever, you know, privileges you may have. And... Uh, uh, that's a feeling of entitlement, and that's a dangerous thing because then, even if you're not performing, even if you're not doing things right, you feel you still deserve it, and nobody can question you. No. It's a dangerous thing. So, what I do tell myself, I say, "Hey, uh, any time, I'm I I should be ready to give up being a pastor." You know, I don't. I, being a pastor, being a leader, is is a gift that God has given. I don't. I'm not entitled to it. I I should be willing to step down anytime, anytime. And the only reason I am, you know, I'm allowed to be here, is one is because of God's grace. Secondly, because I am fulfilling what. God wants me to do. If I fail to fulfill my responsibility, then I, I don't have a right to be in this place. Or if I am not living the way I should be living as a leader, I have no right to be in this place. You know, in fact, <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, like I think uh, maybe six weeks ago, I was ready to fire myself out of my position, you know, my place as a pastor. But what happened was I I actually lost my cool in the office. Um, you know, it's very rare that I lose my calm. 
uh, but it happened like maybe uh, six weeks ago, a uh, month and a half ago. And uh, what was the situation there? There was, yeah, there was, uh, it had to do with one of our people in the media team, you know, and they were doing things that they were not supposed to be doing. And I had, had a, I had a long day. It was like a full day. I think it was a Thursday like this, or Tuesday or Thursday, I forget. Anyway, I had a long day. I'd finished my classes, Bible college classes. I'd gone, I had meetings, meetings, meetings at the office. And then at, in the evening at about 6.30 or something, one of the people in the media team come and they tell me what they're doing and it is like totally off. I was so upset, you know, and I lost it. Like I really, I said, I, you know, I, I spoke very sternly to this person. Uh, why are you doing this and what is going on and, and, and all of that. And then after I did that, I felt very bad because I'm the leader and I should not be losing my calm. I should not. And this was the second time, like I had, you know, once it had happened, maybe about two years ago, I had lost my, I had, uh, lost my cool in the office. And uh, again, I had, uh, you know, I had spoken very sternly to whoever the staff was, but this happened again. This was the second time it happened. And I was so upset with myself. You know, I mean, uh, uh, yes, the, what they were doing was wrong, but uh, I always try to be calm and correct the thing in a very calm way. But that day I lost it. You know, I, I just couldn't stay calm. I, I, I just spoke very sternly. And, uh, there were other people in the office and people saw, saw the whole thing. I was so embarrassed. I was so ashamed. And I, I was also upset with myself that I lost my calm. So I came home, I told my wife, and I said, see, uh, I was just thinking about it, you know, uh, this is not good. This is happening the second time. And uh, this is a serious problem. And as a leader, I can't be like this, you know. And I was thinking, what happened? Why did I do this? Why did I lose my calm? And, uh, and I was actually, I said, you know, what would I do if another staff behaved like this? If another staff behave like this, I would give in. Usually we have a three strike rule at, in our church. I'll talk about it later. That means we give two warnings and the third time they are dismissed. We have a three strike rule. So I said, look, I have to apply the same rule to myself. This is the second time it's happening. That means I've already finished two chances. Third time it happens, I'm fired. I have to fire myself, you know, and so uh, I, I processed the whole thing the same way. I said, see, I have to treat myself the way I treat any other stuff. This three-strike rule applies to me also. And then, uh, so, I, you know, I processed, the, you know, I was thinking about it the whole night. I woke up in the morning. I was you know, just, God, why is this happening? I went to the scriptures. I read all the scriptures about controlling your anger and you know, all those things. And then I sent an email to all our church staff. I said, you know, I apologized for what happened the previous evening. And I and I, I wrote down the same rule. I said, see, if this happens one more time, I will step down as being pastor of the church. I will step down from being on the board of the church. I will step down if it happens one more time. Because the three strike rule applies to me also. I already messed up twice. Uh, in the last two years, two, three years, I've Two times I've lost my cool. Uh, if it happens one more time, I will dismiss myself. I will no longer be the pastor of the church. I will step down. I'll just be an ordinary <laughs> leader. That's it. And so, um, so what am I saying? Uh, we should never feel entitled to this role, anything that we have. It is a gift from God. And the only reason we get to stay there is because we are Fulfilling, fulfilling our responsibility the way we are supposed to. If you don't, we have to, you know, let go of it. Okay, all right. So um, let's go for a break. I know I took all the time, break time already in this lecture. Uh, let's go for a ten minute break. We'll be back in ten minutes. Okay, thanks. <laughs> 